This is Lisa Niver from We Said Go Travel, and I am so honored and delighted and excited to have the most incredible author, neuroscientist, mom, yogi here with me today. Lisa and Genova, tell us, oh my gosh, you're, you're amazing. Thank you for being here. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much. I love your energy and your generosity. It's so fun to know you. Oh, thank you. I mean, you've done so much. I mean, first of all, I don't know that everybody knows that you have a PhD from Harvard in neuroscience. So I know people know you write about neuroscience and you bring these incredible realistic characters into our lives. So I, one of the questions I personally have for you, I've loved your books forever, is what came first? Were you always a writer and then you were a neuroscientist? Like, how did this evolve that you're so at the top of excellence in both of these amazing, hard, challenging fields? Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, I had zero desire or inkling to write um, most of my life. I was a geeky, nerdy scientist always and very laser focused on that and driven since I was like 18. So yeah, I decided I wanted to be a neuroscientist when I was young, when I was 18. Uh, right away in college, studied that. It was called biopsychology back then. It's now a neuroscience major as an undergraduate, um, but that didn't exist yet because I'm that old. Um, and yeah, I went, I, I got a job as um, a lab tech in a neuroscience lab at Mass General Hospital in Boston right out of college, working on the molecular basis of drug addiction. I went on to get my PhD and I studied that at Harvard and at the NIH. Um, I was a fellow at the NIH, and then I, I still had no idea I was going to be a writer, but my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and right about that time that I got my, my degree, and as the neuroscientist in my very big Italian family, I was not her caregiver. We had lots of, you know, she had nine children, so we had lots of um, people to help with caring for her. Um, but I could learn about Alzheimer's and pass that education on to my family to help us be better caregivers. And everything I read, um, it was helpful. I mean, well, I, I read the neuroscience and that was cool and interesting to me, not helpful to my family, but I read about the disease management and how to be a caregiver. So 36 hour a day, memoirs, those types of things. And so I knew the, the worlds of Alzheimer's and yet what was missing from it was the perspective of the person who has it. So at the time, everything was written by a scientist, a clinician, a caregiver, a social worker, and not from the perspective of someone who has it. And what I recognized in myself was I felt a lot of sympathy for my grandmother and a lot of sympathy for us who love her and was we were losing her right in front of us. So felt bad for her and bad for us. And oh, there's sympathy is, is a disconnect, right? She's otherized. So I felt so bad for her, but I didn't feel empathy. I didn't know how to feel with her. I was very uncomfortable around my grandmother's Alzheimer's. I loved her so much. And it was really heartbreaking to watch her lose access to her entire life's history um, and not know who we were. And I remember thinking, well, fiction is a place where you get to walk in someone else's shoes and feel empathy for someone else's experience. And at the time, that kind of story didn't exist about Alzheimer's. And I thought, well, maybe someday I'll write it. Um, and I, I don't know how to write. So I thought, well, that will be when I'm retired someday. And the very fast pace of my professional life has slowed down. Um, I ended up, have, my first child was born in 2000. And I quit my job. I didn't intend to quit right away. I, I was like, I'll take six months to a year off. And then my marriage started to unravel and I didn't go back to work and I was trying to fix my marriage. And I had been with my, my first husband since I was in college. So I was 33 at the time when we got divorced. And so it was very, um, it was so upsetting for me to get divorced. It was very much like my life had been on a very linear, check all the boxes, like I'm doing all the things, quote, right. And now I have this sort of upheaval and this, what I framed as a failure. Um, and I was heartbroken and, and upset and really afraid of an uncertain future. Um, but the fear luckily turned into a curiosity and I started asking myself good questions, which were the, the best were things like, well, you know, what's my future gonna look like? What if I could do anything I wanted? 
Like I, at first I was like, oh, I'll just go back to work. Um, but then I thought, well, what if I could do anything I wanted? And what if I could do anything I wanted and I didn't have to care about what anyone thought of me? And the answer, the thing that just kept bubbling up was you want to write the book. Oh, and I wow. tried like tried like hell to talk myself out of it because I'm like, I don't know how to write. I'm a neuroscientist. I don't write fiction. This is not a safe, stable choice for you right now, girl. You are a divorced, unemployed single mom. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, the, an it was the answer, it was, that was the answer. Every time I asked myself, what would I do if I didn't have to care about money or what anyone thought? And it was, I want to write this book. So against all sort of reason and the, sort of, you know, the logical thing, because it was wildly illogical, I dropped my daughter off at preschool and began doing the research for the book that would become Still Alice. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad you shared that with us because I think, the, I mean, your books have helped and inspired and, and educated so many families about so many terrifying confusing diseases but I think that for all the people like me who as you said you when you get divorced a lot of us feel like complete failures and what am I going to do and what a brilliant question to ask what would I do if I didn't care what anyone else thought and yeah I, it was very it was you know yeah I felt so much shame and fear and that question was really liberating I still ask myself that on a regular basis like am I it's like a very good check in like am I living the life I really want to live um and if not why sometimes there's practical reasons that you can't but are there baby steps like am I you know am I still doing that so yeah it, and so it's you know my whole life changed because of that so I you know I didn't have any writing background and I I became a student again so I read lots of books on craft and I didn't know any other writers which turned out to be helpful because I didn't know what I didn't know and I didn't know how hard <laughs> it is and I didn't know sort of how bleak that it can be and how difficult it is to get published and you know a bit about how hard that can be so I didn't know and so I was sort of blissfully unaware and and I would go into bookstores and and libraries and look at all of the thousands of books and think well all of those people wrote books why can't I why not me um so it helped that in the, the getting out of my own way I think was the hardest part of writing the book it was um giving myself permission to do it oh my gosh that is exactly the way all people start in something new but how incredible that you're I think I might give myself permission to do this turn into a New York Times bestseller and a movie where the actress won the 2015 Oscar. I mean, that was the I best know. actress. I mean, that movie is so beloved. Yeah, it's bananas. And it's so, Lisa, it didn't start that way either, though, because I wrote the book and then no one would publish it. Um, oh. Well, it was no one would represent it. So I, I couldn't, I sent out query letters to 100 literary agents and I heard back no in a form letter, like, dear author, no, thank you. For most, I got three responses saying, we'll read the manuscript, one I never heard back from, and the other two thought that Alzheimer's was just too scary and too depressing of a topic for fiction readers. They thought people would shy away from it and that it just wasn't marketable. So I was, I had really hit a dead end. It was stick the book in the drawer and go back to neuroscience, um, the bench or, or consulting or, or, or biotech. Or, and this was the summer of 2007, I self-published it and I sold it out of the trunk of my car. This was, you know, this was before Facebook. This was like social media was MySpace and Shelfari and it was like very limited, but I did, I used that. Um, I was giving myself one year because I was like, well, you know, if I'm like those contestants for American Idol who are auditioning and can't sing, but think they can sing, I don't want to you know, I got to get my life going. I have, to, I have to earn a living. Like I have to, if this doesn't work, I have to get going here. So um, I was giving myself a year and it, and in 10 months, word of mouth led to a literary agent who took me on and she sold the book to Simon and Schuster. Yeah. So that it ended up being this book that's been like, you know, it's translated into 37 languages and Julianne Moore has an Oscar. So it's, it's, so it's such a fun story to tell. Your mouth is hanging open. It's like, yeah, I went from like, this was in the trunk of my car. I was begging people to read it. Oh my goodness. I think it's so important that people hear 
that, you know, obviously at this point where you have potential movie deals for three more books, there's an Oscar from one of the movies, your TED Talk's been watched by 8 million people, that it's hard sometimes to remember that everybody starts at the beginning and that a hundred agents really kind of ignored you. And yeah. I mean, gosh, would it be fun to write them all now? But don't do that. That's bitter. You're not bitter. But no, no, no. But, but, it is, but it's like that scene from Pretty Woman when Julia Roberts goes back to the store where the women wouldn't wait on her. And she's like, you guys work on commission, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. And it's fine because it is, you know, and that that I still hear that to this day, Lisa. It's um, there are people who will come up to me and say, you know, everyone tells me that your book is beautiful and it's helped them, but I just can't go near it yet. Like it's too close. Oh. I can't do it. It's just, it's too upsetting right now. And I, I, I understand that like for some, so there is that element of this book is this topic, the subject it's heavy. It's hard for folks, depending on where you are in the journey. If Alzheimer's is in your life, um, it, it can be, it can be hard to read this book. Um, it takes courage. I, I agree with you. It can be hard. I know for myself, we have a family member um, that had ALS and, and isn't with us anymore. But every note played was such a beautiful journey. Your characters, when I was reading it, I feel like I know them. I mean, mm. your your character development is so brilliant and, and compelling. And I who first called you an empathy warrior? I love that. Oh my gosh, I can't remember where that started. I, I think it was it. in Australia um, on a book tour there. Someone, like, you know, people introduce you for talks and they come up with their own little spin on your bio. And I was like, ooh, I love that. Um, yeah, because that's so after Still Alice and Still Alice, when I was given permission to continue because now I could feed my family, um, make a living doing this, it was okay, well, I get to combine these two things that I care about now, right? So it's like, I, I'm passionate about the brain and brain health and how does the brain work to allow us to think and feel and remember um, and everything else. And and what about all of these people who live with neurological diseases and disorders and mental illness who, because of something going wrong or, or working differently in their brains, that they become otherized and stigmatized and, and people don't know what's going on with them. And so that lack of familiarity, that lack of language to be able to talk about what that is makes people feel afraid, right? So if you've got something going on with your brain and I don't know what that is, I feel afraid of you. Um, and so that further you know, stigmatizes and alienates folks and and feeling lonely and alienated on top of the what's difficult is just, you know, such an unnecessary price to pay. So my mission, my purpose in my writing is to humanize and to and engender empathy and compassion for people who have neurological stuff going on. Yes. I mean, you're you're such a gifted storyteller. I mean, I remember reading Left Neglected, which was the one about traumatic brain injury, if anyone hasn't read that one yet, and and the the drawing. And um I have I have an intermittent left esotropia that was undiagnosed for a very long time. So I have I don't have full left neglect, but I had a lot of missing pieces. And for me, it was so interesting to read about someone else and be like, how they experience and I just, I mean, how do you come up with these ideas and, and are the people drawn from your giant Italian family or where are you getting all this inspiration? Oh, thank you. And before I answer you, you really just hit on something that is also magical, a magical sort of byproduct of all of this. And it is now I'm very mindful of it is that, so the books not only help educate with respect to the experience and compassion and empathy for people who have no knowledge of TBI or ALS or Alzheimer's. Like I don't have that in my family and I might never read a book about, I'm certainly not going to read a nonfiction book about ALS if that doesn't affect my life, but I might read a novel and now I get that education. But for people who do live it, the books, because I, I really do my homework and I am trying to tell the truth under these imagined circumstances, you know, and portray with dignity and respect that they have a chance to feel seen and heard, 
right? That on these pages, like you just said, with respect to your experience, like, oh, that's, that's how I feel. That's what happens to me. And there's so much healing that can happen in that, right? To know that you're not alone and to get, to feel like that, that you can point to this and say, this is me. Um, so I love being able to do that. Um, so I pick my topics. It depends. So left neglected the, the book about the traumatic brain injury and left neglected that came out of a curiosity. I didn't know anyone with it prior to doing the research for that book. Um, Oliver Sacks wrote a book called the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Mm -hmm. He's a neurologist and these are true stories and, and they're sort of like short stories of clinical vignettes of folks with really interesting brain stuff. Like he, um, he wrote the book Awakenings, which was a movie with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. Um, there was a three page story in that about a guy with left neglect. And I was so blown away by it. It's just super quick. And I thought, well, what happens to him? Like he's in a hospital in the, in the story. I'm like, does he go home? How do you live? How do you walk through a whole world if you're only aware of half of it? So I, that was just, what is this like to experience that? Um, the book on autism, Love Anthony, was um, inspired by my cousin. Um, she's like a sister to me. Her son has very severe autism. So instead of, you know, the Temple Grandins and a lot of people out there who have the high functioning Asperger's end of autism, like what is the other end where folks are nonverbal and don't like to be touched, can't make eye contact. So like, what is that experience like? And how has that felt? Um, ALS came out of Still Alice. Richard Glatzer, the um, co-writer of the script and the co-director. Um, it was, uh, that Still Alice movie was directed and written by Wash Westmerlin and Richard Glatzer. Um, Richard was diagnosed with ALS just a couple of months before he read the book and agreed to be involved in the film. And so he, was on set filming 12 hours a day. Um, his ALS began in the motor neurons of his neck and head, so he couldn't speak and he was drooling. And one of his arms, maybe his right, was completely paralyzed and he's typing with one finger on an iPad. Um, and so I, I was, you know, he's a ma heroic man um, and just a beautiful soul, good guy. He, um, he and I, you know, by the end of the filming, I asked him if I could write about ALS next. And would he be the first person that I came to know to explain to me what it feels like? And so he said, yes. And we corresponded through email right up until just before the Oscars. My last email from him, he typed with his right big toe. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a combination of personal and, you know, I know someone or I just am really curious. It, it's It's amazing, amazing what you've done. And I know there's a new book on the horizon. So I... Are you allowed to tell us what are you diving into next to really help people have the, like you're saying, the, either their personal experience revealed or, or have more empathy? Yeah, so I'm writing, I'm, in, I'm about 200 pages into my next novel. It's about a young woman with bipolar disorder. And I chose bipolar because I have had this notion, and I'm, I think I'm spot on, that this is something hiding in plain sight everywhere that this is a neurological issue you know mental illness issue where people feel there's a lot of shame and a lot of stigma and so people are keeping it secret and not talking about it and so i'm really hopeful to tell a story that becomes a, a vehicle for conversation to to normalize and humanize and talk about a subject that we can you know if our communities can be more empathetic and compassionate that we can maybe, you know, collapse the distance between people who don't have bipolar and people who do, and that, that maybe that will help uh, people who are going through that. It's a really tough um, disorder to live with. Um, it, and it requires, I think, a lot of support from community to do well with it. And a lot of people do great with it. But in the beginning, when you're trying to figure it out and you're feeling alone in it and like you have to hide it, mm. it's such a lot of unnecessary burden to deal with. So I'm excited to put this one out there. Well, I can't wait for that. But while people are waiting for that, in case anyone hasn't read your nonfiction book, Remember, I yeah. think that remember shares so much about how important it is to pay attention. And I love that you talk about forgetting is not evil. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that book came out of, you know, talking about still Alice and Alzheimer's for so many years that I found that 
most people, especially over the age of 40, have this, you know, really sort of unhealthy relationship with their own memory that in these moments of forgetting that we all experience every day, just as a normal part of being human, people go into a, a tailspin and a panic and a, and, a, and there's fear and anxiety and stress over, oh my God, I must be losing my mind or my memory is terrible, or I might be getting Alzheimer's. This is, this is the first sign. And I recognize like, oh, people have this expectation that memory is supposed to be perfect. Right. And it's just not our human brains aren't designed to remember everything. And there are things that we'll, we'll always fail at um, if we only rely on our brains. So things like to-do lists are perfectly okay. Um, or why don't you walk into a room and you don't know why you're in there and that's <laughs> normal. And here's why that happens. So I wanted to explain to people like, okay, here's sort of the owner's manual. This is how memory works. This is what it needs. This is what it doesn't need, this is why it forgets. Here's you know how you can improve it and optimize it and keep it healthy. And here's what you can let go of day to day and and not worry about. Um, if you can't, you know, it's not designed to remember to do things later, remember people's names. Um, it does it doesn't catalog everything we encounter. It only remembers what you pay attention to. So just real super quick, folks, if you are regularly forgetting where you put your glasses, your keys, your phone, where you parked your car. Oh my God, what does that mean? Am I getting Alzheimer's? I'm betting you didn't pay attention to where you put them. Because if you don't give it a moment's attention, that's a neurological input. You cannot create a memory of anything past this present moment unless you give it your attention. So we didn't make a memory of it in the first place. You didn't forget anything. I think it's brilliant that you called it an owner's manual because I, I do think you give so many quality explanations and tips about encoding memories and feelings and journals. But I also think it's really important you have really clear information about we can help our brains with yeah. you know our choices every day. What do we eat? Do we exercise? And like you said, you're a yogi. Do we meditate? But can you talk for a minute? I think it's really important that people hear from you about the, that we think stress is the biggest issue, but that the lack of sleep is really, really a problem. Yeah. And it's not, you know, we can't, I'm not, I don't know which one impacts you more um, and whether it's reactivity to stress and can you be less reactive to stress? Because we're not going to be able to remove the the stressful world from doing what it's doing. It's how we react to it. But sleep is big and it stresses people out, unfortunately, to hear this because a lot of people <laughs> are not good at sleeping. But the data is super clear. It's just really compelling that human brains and human bodies need seven to nine hours of sleep because sleep is not a state of unconscious nothingness. We are very biologically busy while we sleep and we're repairing and we're restoring we're consolidating memories, we're cleaning up metabolic debris that accumulated during the business of being awake. Like a lot of important things are going on. And if you don't get the right phases and the right amount of sleep, then you're disrupting those processes. They're interrupted and not completing. And so over time that can create some health issues and can create some memory problems. Um, so so knowing that, I don't want to just like, then people are like, oh my God, I don't sleep enough. I'm all, like, I'm in trouble. And it's like, well, everything up until today's water under the bridge, what can you do tonight to support a good night's sleep? And sometimes I got a, I did not get a good night's sleep last night. So I'm not panicked. It's just like, all right, new day, new night. What can I do? So there's, you know, we don't, have, this is a whole other episode, Lisa, um, but people can Google. There's lots like, is your room temperature as, is it too hot? You won't be able to fall asleep. Um, write down your to-do list tomorrow if, if thoughts are cranking and you can't you know, shut your brain off. Um, are you exercising during the day because that helps you fall asleep at night? Um, there are things you could get off your screens. Like, you know, your poor pineal gland is like, it's daytime if you're staring at this right up until the moment you want to fall asleep because that light is telling your brain that it's daytime. So if we can get back in the rhythm of the planet, which it would in you know normal times would help us fall asleep. So there are things we can do that I'm betting people who are saying, I just can't fall asleep and it's that's the way it is. It's like, well, let's get empowered, right? We have agency and influence here. Like what can you do to help support a better night's sleep tonight and see if that works? It's worth it. 
I agree with you. It could be its whole own episode. And I would love to have the chance to talk to you again. But I just wanted to put that out there because I think one of the things that people forget um there's a i think sometimes in american medicine it's a lot about what can you take or what treatment can you have and it's important that if you ate some more vegetables and you turned your screens off early and you got a good night's sleep you might feel a whole lot better and yeah i mean remember there's simple it's, steps yeah it's we live in a funny culture everybody wants the magic pill like can i just destroy my brain and body and then just give me the magic pill to fix it um but there are ways you know, we, we all want to live a, you know, a long life, but we yes. want to match our brain span to our lifespan, right? We don't want to live to be 80, but have Alzheimer's at 80. So that is going to require some ways of living along the way, because we know that like lifestyle, you know, how the health of your brain and body has a combination of the genes you've inherited and how you live. Can't do anything about the genes you inherited, but we can do a lot about the way you live. So if you can incorporate, you know, a healthy lifestyle on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't feel like deprivation. It doesn't feel hard. Once you get in the habits of yummy, healthy food and daily exercise, um, it feels good. You feel better. And then you're, you're setting yourself up for, for a healthy brain uh, for, for a lifetime. I think that's the perfect segue towards the end of our conversation about choices, because the thing you started with about how you came into being a writer was, you know, what choices do I want to make with my life if I just really think what's really going to fulfill me and make me so happy? So you said it much more eloquently. What was your comment about you asked yourself one question about what you should do with your life? Yeah, I love what you're saying. Yeah, can we be intentional, right? It's if I could do anything I wanted, what would I do? Yeah. And to this day for me still, it's, I want to write the next book. That's what I'm doing. That is so exciting. And in we can't wait for the next book to come out. And I know it's possible several of the books are going to be movies soon. Is that, is that in the works? Can you talk uh, about that? You're not talking about your that lips to God's ears. Okay. Yes, you have three in development and uh, I am so glad I write books and I don't make movies because it's a lot of puzzle pieces and you're not in control of a lot of them. So we have actors and then actors don't, we don't have oh, okay. actors. And so we're trying to collect everybody, but yes, every note played inside the O'Briens and left neglected are all in development and any one of them could pop soon. So hopefully we're filming at least one before the end of this year. Oh my goodness. It's so exciting. I mean, <laughs> Lisa, your books, I love them. It's been my honor to write about them. I really appreciate all of your support in my writing career. And I just wish you so much incredible success with all of it. And, and really thank you from all your readers that don't get this opportunity to speak to you directly, but will be listening that we love your books. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much. I am cheering you on as well. And thank you for being such a, a support. It's fun. To, it's fun that we got connected. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if people want to find you, what's the best way to look for you on the internet or social media? Where can they get updates about books? So the best I'm on Instagram and Facebook. That's really me, author Lisa Genova. And my website is lisagenova.com. Perfect. And everybody, if you want to learn more, don't forget to watch her TED Talk, which already has 8 million views. So thank you so much. And I can't wait to buy your next book. Oh, thank you, Lisa.